Hey guys, Radio Dave here. So, people have been asking me lately uh, tips on how to DJ. I don't know why they're asking me. I don't really know what the fuck I'm doing. But, um, so I figured I'd put together a couple of tips and maybe help some people out who are just starting or just trying to figure things out. So I'm going to share with you guys nine tips that I've discovered over the last 12 years of my DJ career. Number one, the most important thing of all time, most important rule, I don't care what anybody says, is the gear does not matter. When it comes to DJing, the club standard pretty much internationally is the Pioneer CDJs. 2000s, 3000s, whatever, any reputable club is going to be rocking the CDJ bass system. Now, as long as the mixer is a high enough model, that means you as a DJ can have several options integrating with the system. USBs, Serato, record box, etc. But that shit ain't cheap. Even to buy a mid-tier all-in-one like an SX, which I do highly recommend for new guys starting out when they can afford to do so, you're still talking anywhere from like 1000 1200 to 1500 and when you're day one into your DJ career, that's just not realistic. But I'm here to tell you that that's okay, because virtual DJ is free. Don't cost a dime. And if you've got any half-assed laptop kicking around, you can download a few songs, throw them in the virtual DJ, and start feeling around. Now, I know this is going to send a shiver down some DJ spines, but fuck them. Virtual DJ is a great system to start out on and to begin to figure out the basics of what it takes to spin on the ones and twos. I can say this with confidence, and I'm going to, because that's exactly how I did it. I didn't know the first thing about DJing when I started. Some may say I still don't. But I downloaded Virtual DJ and just started throwing tracks in there, figuring out BPMs, speed matching, mixing in different keys, discovering song structure and the list goes on there's a million things you can learn from djing just by fumbling around in virtual dj in fact i started my very first dj residency at the biggest club in town djing with virtual dj they had cdjs available but i had no idea how to use them so no joke i literally started djing the busiest club in town using a laptop virtual dj and an ox cord the other dj <laughs> the other dj who'd been doing it for 20 years <laughs> was horrified and it wasn't long before he started showing me how to use cdjs but the crowd i had no idea and that's the main point of tip number one it doesn't matter what gear you're using it's the music that matters i may have been using the laptop and an aux cord but my mixes were fucking fire because i understood the music i was a drummer for 20 years before that and that definitely helped transition into the world of dj i understood the music and i knew how to work the crowd the gear will come and the skill to use it will come but for right now just worry about the music that's all that really matters when it comes to djing tip number two edm song structure now all music is different not nickelback okay settle down all genres are different different tempos different time signatures everything but when you get down to the very basics of it most 128 bpm house and edm tracks work in 15 second increments depending if you're working with a radio edit extended or original mix they will all for the most part work in increments of 15 let's have a look at this track that i've imported into serato now, typically, within an EDM track, you start out with the filtered intro. Usually times out to about 30 seconds. Followed by the non-filtered intro, another 30 seconds. Then the verse, which is about a minute, 60 seconds. And you'll get a build, typically 15 seconds, could be 30 depending on the track. And the first drop, 30 seconds, give or take. It'll be increments of 15. Some guys might go for 45, some might go for 60, depending on if it's an extended or not. Then you got your breakdown, 30 seconds, give or take, maybe a little longer. The second build, 15 seconds into the second drop, which usually goes a little longer than the first. So you're talking 45, 60 seconds. And the outro for 30 seconds to 60 seconds, depending on whether or not you've got an extended or a radio edit or what have you. Now, obviously, this isn't the concrete rules, but typically this is what you'll see in a track. Now, this is good knowledge to keep in the back of your mind. But Serato does a great job of illustrating it, too. You can see here, just when looking at the track loaded in, the different sections of the song. The greener parts are the less dynamic areas, intro, verse, breakdown, and the red-pink areas are the more dynamic spots, or the drops, usually. So even without playing the song, you can look at the total time, see the various areas and their colors, and get a general idea of how the song is going to play out. If you start getting into dubstep, hard style, side trance, trap, or any of the half-step stuff, the rules will be slightly different, of course. But even then, the basic idea of an EDM song structure should give you a good start to how to anticipate the journey of any track you load up. Tip number three, 0.8 equals 1 BPM. 
There are a million different aspects to DJ. Beat matching, key, arrangement, vocal clashing, bass phasing. But the number one thing you need to know as a DJ is 0.8 equals 1 BPM. Now what the fuck does that mean? When you're activating the sliders of your platters, it doesn't know what a BPM is. It only knows notches. Every platter in the world has a slider and every slider has notches. And you would think if one track is 127 BPM and the other is 128, then I should be able to move the slider up one notch to make it get to 128. But that's not the case. That would be too easy. One BPM does not equal a full notch. Instead, it's closer to about 0.8. A lot of machines now will tell you the BPM right off the hop, but you can't always rely on that. Some songs have tempo changes, others quantize incorrectly, etc. So the BPM isn't always right. The notches, however, are always right. If you need to track up 1 BPM, that's 0.8 notches. 2 BPM, 1.6 notches. 4 BPM, 3.2. I don't mind telling you, I have literally broken out the calculator app on my phone on more than one occasion to do quick math. Quick math. To figure out just how many notches I need to move to get two vastly different tracks to beat match. Tip number four, EQ knobs. Any deck across the entire spectrum of DJ brands. Don't forget virtual softwares. And virtual softwares will have the same three knobs going down above the center of each channel fader. High, mid, and low. You might have a filter or effects knob there too, but for this, we're just focusing on the first three. Now I'm going to do a massive generalization here that will probably make a lot of DJs twist up with rage, but for the most part, the quick and dirty of it is the low knob will house your kick and your lower bass line. The mid will house your vocals and the highs, the higher end cymbals and whatnot. I don't usually mess with the high knob almost ever, very rarely if at all. The mids I will mostly use if my incoming track has vocals and I don't want to bring the full instruments in too hot. I'll bring the fader up about three quarters or four fifths, boost the mids, and now I've got the vocals at a good place to start bringing in the next track. The lows are the ones I use the most. And the reason for that is the low is where the kick lives. And every track has a kick. And it's almost throughout the entirety of every song. And if you have two kicks playing at the same time, they will either hit on top of each other or they'll phase each other out and you'll get no kick at all. So I will always only have one kick going at a time on a track. Typically, it's I'll be mixing in the incoming track's intro and leave the kick on the outro of the outgoing track. Then once the outgoing track ends, I'll immediately bring up the knob on the incoming track. So my low knobs are in a constant state of flux the entirety of my set, swapping back and forth from track to track. Tip number five. Mix in on the one. Now, depending on the style of DJ you are, there's a million different ways you can mix. You can literally mix in your incoming track any point you want. Might sound like total shit, but in theory, you could do it at any point in the song. There's only one rule. Always mix in on the one. What's the one? Keanu Reeves? No. No, yes he is. I saw it in a movie. Okay, yes, but no, that's not the one I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm right, though. That's all I care about. I know kung fu. You're fucking telling me. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... I'm talking about the one count. The one count and your four count. Now this all depends on the time signature of your track. Some tracks will use a 3-4 time signature, like non strips Devil's Barbecue. But for the most part, you're going to be dealing with 4-4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. To mix properly, when this is the only solid concrete rule in DJing, and music altogether really, you have to come in on the first count. You have to come in on the one. The first beat of any measure. If you come in on the three, you're going to be off. If you come in on the two, you're going to look like a fucking idiot. So you always have to be counting in your head. You don't have to be doing it actively, as you can train yourself to do it subconsciously. And eventually your brain will develop muscle memory, and you'll be able to feel when the count is coming. Because eventually your four count will begin to coincide with your 15 30 second sections from tip number two. You want to mix in on the drop? Hit the first beat of the 30 second section. You want to mix in on the outro? First beat of that 30 second section. Tip number six. When to mix in. Part two, or when to mix in, is continuing on the last line of tip number five. What part of the song are we mixing in on? That depends on two factors. What time are you playing? And what's the audience? Is this a wedding? Is it a club? Are you the opening DJ? Are you the headliner? What part of the song should you be mixing in on? Now, like I've said a million times already, depending on the style of DJ you are, this varies. But me, personally, I almost always mix in the incoming track on the last drop of my outgoing track. It usually times out fairly well that the intro of my incoming track will end the same time as the outro of my outgoing track. And then I can leave the outro of the outgoing track or not, depending on what I'm going for. If you listen to all 111 episodes of Radio Dave's Radio Waves, you'll hear this time and time and time again. Do you have to do this? No, of course not. But this is what I prefer to do. This will work anywhere. Weddings, 
clubs, corporate events, kids' birthday parties. It's smooth and it'll keep a steady vibe going the whole night. For clubs though, we might vary this up a little bit. If you're an opening DJ, I would stick to this. The beginning of the night, people want to hear the whole song, they want to sing along, they want to hear stuff they know. But if you're headlining, it's 12, 30, 1 o'clock at night. Some songs are too long. People are hyped. They want to keep it moving. In that instance, I'll mix it on the first drop instead. This will keep things moving very quickly. Almost too quickly. It can be very chaotic and anxious. So I won't do this for every song. So I'll usually go two songs mixing in on the first drop, and then the third song come in on the second drop to add some space and some breathing room. Then two more songs on the first, another on the second. I'll follow this pattern for most of the night and change it up on the fly when I feel like it. This isn't a concrete rule, I just find it works for me. Longer form sets though, two, three hours or longer, I'd stick to the last drop rule, especially weddings. Tip number seven, mic work. Now I'm gonna say something here that a lot of DJs aren't going to agree with. Mic work is important. You need to know how to work a mic. Fuck you! I know this is hard because because most of us don't have the best people skills. Who does? And extremely timid using a microphone. Hi everybody! I get it. It's everybody! Good? If we weren't, we'd be lead singers in a band. Not spinning records in the dark corner of some nightclub. But here's the thing. People want to interact with you. They want to know you're alive and in the moment and that you're having a good time. You can be crushing it in the booth, absolutely fucking destroying your set. And if you're not on the mic, the crowd might not feel you want to be there. If you open the mic and interact with them, they will feel how much fun you're having and want to be there with you. What makes for great mic work? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. But every morning after I DJ, I suffer from something called a microphone hangover. I wake up and I go, oh my god, I can't believe I said that on the mic last night. Why do people keep letting me talk on microphones? You're gonna have to get over that. Because the wild, fun shit you say on the mic might be completely insane, but in the moment, in the context, it can really add something special to the party. There's only one rule here. Be confident. Be confident when you say it. Don't waver at all. If you do, if you waver at all, or act like you don't believe what you're saying, or don't even want to be holding the mic, the crowd will feel that and they will hate it. But if you're confident, they'll love you. Also, don't talk over the drop. People hate that. Oh yeah, I hate when DJs do that. I know, buddy. Me too. Tip number eight. Never stop recording a mix. A friend of mine made a post a few weeks ago about how hard a time she has recording mixes because she almost always fucks up halfway through and has to start it over. I was dumbfounded. What do you mean start over? Then I opened up the comments and saw the post and had blown up with dozens of DJs all saying the same thing. That it takes them forever to put a mix out because they keep screwing up during recording. I couldn't believe it. Folks, let me tell you this now. You don't have to stop your mix just because you fucked up a transition 30 minutes in. Do you know how hard that is to do? To nail a perfect mix on your first try? It's fucking impossible. <gasps> you mean there's a better way? And I promise you, there's a better way. If you're in the middle of your mix and you fuck up a transition, no, 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 it's okay. No, no. Stop the tracks, go back a couple beats, and go again. Do this as many times as you need. You can edit it out after you've finished recording in Audition or Audacity or, or any audio production software, really. It's not hard. And I know, I know, it fucks with your flow a bit. But not nearly as much as stopping the mix and starting over from the fucking beginning. I'm on episode 111 of Radio Dave's Radio Waves. If I stopped my recording and started over every time I fucked up a transition, I'd still be on episode one. I've actually made a video on this already, so you can click here and check out the full breakdown and how exactly to do that, and save your mixes from a bad transition. All right, tip number nine, my last tip of the day, and I'm gonna catch a lot of grief on this one, I know, and a lot of DJs aren't gonna agree with me, but tip number nine is don't be afraid to take requests. I'll fucking kill you. I know, I know. Requests as a DJ are pure and utter bullshit, and when you're being flown in to close a headlining set at a club or festival, I will 100% agree. They hired you to play your set, play your music. They want you to play your set, play your music. However, with that being said, we're not all catching headlining gigs right off the bat. A lot of us are playing weddings, corporate gigs, birthday parties, honestly, whatever pays the bills. <laughs> weddings can make you a lot of money. And those types of gigs, they don't want to hear your 45 minute moon baton techos routine. They want to hear Taylor Swift six times a night. They want to hear Venga Boys. They want to hear their favorite songs. Songs that have memories tied to them, tied to the family members that are there, that they haven't seen in 10 years. They don't want to hear your sick mashup of John Summit and Turn Down For What. Even though it's a banger, they want to hear Cotton Eye Joe. A lot of DJs are afraid to take requests, but I say do it. Go for it. 
Take the request. Show how sick a DJ you are by figuring out a way to mix it in and make it work. Grab a sick bootleg or remix of the track. Guys like Vandal on the track, Wesh, or Angelo the Kid. Those guys are putting out sick remixes all the time. Oh, Jesse Block 2. Yes, yes, Jesse Block 2. These legends are dropping incredible remixes and bootlegs of songs everybody knows and will absolutely slay at weddings, at corporate gigs. So do not be afraid to take requests. Challenge yourself and show the crowd how easy you are to work with so you can keep raking in those bread and butter wedding gigs. All right, that's it. That's my nine tips on how to be a better DJ starting out. Hope you learned something. You might not agree with all of them, but this is what's worked for me in my 12 years of DJ. If you learned anything, drop a comment, drop a like, subscribe. If you liked what I had to say, if you had fun. If not, throw that in there too. I want to hear all about it. And what's something else that we can talk about that I can make a video of that you guys want to hear and see? Let me know. I want to hear from you. Radio Dave and the Radio Cave. I'll catch you guys next time.